as Jake said, my name's Adam. Uh, I've been at Church Front for a little while now, but before that, I was doing um, a lot of front of house audio, touring with bands, uh, managing venues. Um, I went to school for audio engineering, so a lot of the studio stuff I learned in the classroom or in the studio, and then a lot of live sound stuff uh, just through experience of, of touring with bands and um, managing audio at venues. So uh, I won't say that I'm the expert, and I don't think that you should listen to, oh yeah, I don't think anyone should say that they are the expert. I'm sure that, that Jesse will even say that he's continuing to learn and that there are people that he's drawing from. So um, yeah, I, I do have a lot of experience, but uh, don't expect me to say that I'm, I'm the know-all, end-all of, of everything audio. So I hope that you can approach this with the same attitude, that you can um, definitely learn a lot here, but uh, continue to learn from, from other sources as well. Um, so that's me. We're going to be talking about broadcast audio fundamentals. So a lot of this stuff is going to translate um, from live sound to studio to broadcast mix. Uh, it's a lot about concepts that are going to tra translate between each of those things. So um, I just want to start off with talking about channel signal flow, and then we'll get into more of the, the big picture after that. Um, but what we have is, sorry, is my microphone too far away? Get a little bit closer there. Um, so we're going to talk about channel signal flow. Uh, this is for every channel, whether it's front of house or your broadcast mix. So it always starts with the source. Um, so that wasn't a ploy, but just now I just fixed my microphone because I didn't think that I was getting good source tone. It was too far away, so I pulled it closer. Um, that's a real life example for you guys of, of focusing on the source tone. I wanted to make sure that my headset was properly placed so that I'm getting the best source tone possible. Um, so when I talk about source tone, I'm going to be using these phrases. Um, that is referring to the source, however it's connected. So this, is, ha this soundboard has some XLR outputs. It's going into a, um, a snake that's going to the front of house board. Sometimes you have a guitar that's plugged into a DI box. Other times there'll be microphones that are plugged into the preamp. So whenever I refer to source, that's what I'm talking about. Um, that's that's going to be uh, probably like... 40 to 50% of the sound of your instrument is going to come from capturing proper source tone. And then another huge part of that is going to be the gain. Um, and when I talk about that, that's the adjusting the preamp of the soundboard to an appropriate level for processing. So every channel that comes in, you're going to use the gain knob to make sure that you're getting a proper level coming into the soundboard. And that's going to be another giant part of the sound or the tone of your instrument. Um, after that, we've got EQ, and I will say here, just disclaimer, EQ and compression can be flipped. You can put compression before EQ, EQ after compression, um, but those are the next two parts of the chain, and when we refer to EQ, we're talking about uh, shaping the tone of the instrument by boosting or cutting different frequencies, and you'll see that as we get into the rest of the uh, lesson today, but... When I'm talking about EQ, that's what I'm referring to. It's going to make a big difference, but uh, honestly not as big of a difference as capturing the tone of the instrument and getting proper gain. Uh, but as you can see like by these arrows here, like the source goes into the gain, and then gain affects EQ, gain affects compression, gain affects your mix and your effects buses. So um, that's why that diagram is there to remind us of um, the flow of the, the processing. Um, so compression next, that is controlling the dynamics of the signal, so the dynamic range. A lot of times you'll have a vocalist or an instrument where you know, they're playing quieter and then they play louder, and uh, that's not exactly what we're trying to achieve with, um, with our mix. So compression allows us to have a better, a shorter dynamic range um, as we're mixing. And then you can see here we have this little offshoot. Uh, so that is talking about the copy of a signal. So um, everything that you do, you can see here before, affects what happens to your effects or buses. Um, and again, disclaimer, you can put the tap somewhere else and have it be sent before um, EQ or compression. But for the most part, especially referring to your live stream, uh, it's going to be affecting your effects and your buses. So 
Um, this is a copy of the signal that's sent to the time-based effects like the reverb or the delay uh, in your monitors, and in this case, your live stream mix. Uh, and then finally, we get to our mixing. So if you're part of the Mixing for Worship course, you've experienced this. Uh, we've made a ton of lessons, and we just started using the soundboard um, a week or two ago because we talked a lot about source tone, capturing the instrument as it should be, um, and then just the mixing mindset in general. Uh, so also, if you're part of the course, you'll recognize this diagram, and uh, you probably won't be able to sit close enough to see everything that's going on, uh, but I'll also show you on the soundboard here. Um, so what we have here is just the entire mix. It's, it's really important to just understand your whole workflow, um, and I know that that can sound daunting, but uh, if you were to build this, exact diagram uh, for your church or for your mix, um, you would just have a way better understanding of everything that is happening and where it goes. Um, so if you're part of the, the course, you, this is a download available to you, but I'll talk through it and then we'll, we'll look at the board as well. But um, what we have is every input and everywhere that it's going. So uh, at the top, we have all of our inputs in these little bluish gray boxes, so that's our whole drum kit. And then we have other instruments, and then we have our vocals, and then uh, you know some speaking microphones over here. And all these arrows show where the mix is going. So these black lines, uh, they're going right to the main mix, or they're going to different buses. So we have like our drum smack, our um, compressed drums, and then we have our, just our drum reverb, and everything ends up going to the main mono center mix for our subs and then our main left-right mix that goes to the mains. Um, so this is, this is a cool experience, a cool um, fun thing to do. Uh, I definitely recommend giving this a shot, even if it's just on a, a big piece of paper, but just like getting your mind around everything that's happening within your soundboard. Um, it's going to make building your soundboard scene and actively mixing a lot easier. Um, signal flow is, uh, is really important, but it can get hairy. So uh, that's, that's one thing that you'll just continually be working on, continually thinking about is um, how is signal getting from point A to point B. So that is our, our giant mixing diagram. And I'll show you a little bit on our soundboard here. If, uh, Chipper, you want to put um, this uh, larger shot on the, the main screens here. Um, so we have all of our input channels, right? So we have our bass, acoustic, electric, keys, tracks, vocals, and then on the second page we have all of our drums. Um, so we have our inputs, as I showed on the diagram, and then all of these are being sent to buses. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can build a mix, uh, but I just found for being able to control the live stream and being able to control the front of house mix uh, I like this workflow, um, especially for this, for this board. So all of our drums are going to two places here. Uh, one is our drum parallel compression. Uh, so this, this is every channel here. Uh, as you can see here, our stereo bus is off. So none of these channels are going directly to the mains. Um, they're all being sent to buses before they go to the main mix. So... Um, all of our drums here are going to this drum parallel compression, and we're adding some additional uh, compression on there um, here. And then we have our regular drum mix, and these are not being compressed, so that's just our, our raw drums, and we kind of mix those in together. Um, we'll go through actually hearing a multi-track later, but for now we're just going to talk through the, the mixing workflow. So all of our drums go to those two places and then go to... Uh, a DCA, um, which they don't go through the DCA, but the DCA controls the volume of it, and then it goes to the main mix. Um, then all of these channels, similarly, we've got our bass through keys, all the instruments and the tracks are going to the instrument bus. Uh, here there's also some light compression to, to glue those together, and then it's controlled by a DCA going to our main mix. Um, we have our vocals, same thing. Vocals are being mixed into this bus, and then our bus is being sent to our main mix. 
And then we have all of our effects. So we have a drum reverb. All of our drums are being sent a copy of the drum signal flow. And then here we have an effects uh, inserted. So here we've got all of our effects. I don't know, it's a little bit harder to see, but uh, we've got different reverbs and delays. So those are all being routed through these buses. And then uh, we have the returns of those coming to this stream effects bus. So uh, I did that pretty quickly, and I know that this, this board is, uh, is specific to this mix, and it's specific to this workflow, but that just goes to show that you can, do, um, you can do a mix a lot of different ways, and it's just important to know what it is. So if you want to copy this workflow, that's awesome. If you have a different um, kind of workflow that you want to go with, that's fine, but you have to know it. You, you really have to understand it, and that's why drawing out a diagram is a, a really good exercise to just help you uh, understand everything that's happening, how signal's getting from point A to point B. So I didn't have it on a point, but uh, signal flow is another one of those things that, that you just have to understand and that you'll continue to, to learn and, and run into in every scenario, whether it's front of house, broadcast, studio mixing. So um, we've covered the layout of the board. Um, does anyone have any specific questions about that before we, we dive into the next thing? Cool. I was, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So each channel is it's not going to the main mix. It's going to one of these buses. Um, so here we have this bass channel and it's going into the instrument bus. So if I, if I select the bus and hit sends on fader, um, I have them all at negative five. Um, I just found putting them at zero just gave me a little too much signal. So I mixed them all at negative five and they are post fader. So that means uh, on our main mix, um, when we're mixing uh, just our, our regular main mix, like you can see the electric guitar is down a little bit more. Um, that changes what's being sent to this instrument bus. Um, so if I were to pull this out, it would you know, be out of the mix, um, but it's all, it's all going to these specific buses. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So, so when you get to the PCA, how is that different from the mix bus? Um, that, uh, it just allows me to have a single fader on the surface. So it's, it's just like a volume control. Jesse, do you want to say something? Okay, I thought you were... Yeah, feel free to interject if there's anything that you uh, want to add. Um, but yeah, the DCAs, they just kind of allow me the, the layout of this board specifically. Um, it doesn't have paired stereo channels. So in the buses, I have to have two faders, and I'm just using the DCA so that if I'm mixing in a live scenario, uh, I can have a single fader for drums, a single fader for instruments, and then have my uh, effects all available. So if I were mixing a, a live service right now, I could pretty much keep it on this page here on this side, and then I'd only have to bounce to this second page if I wanted to adjust the drum mix, uh, like you know, pull up specifically one of the, the floor toms or something. Um, but you could pretty much mix on the surface with this layout that I'm using. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you've been able to do a virtual sound check um, and you, you have it kind of dialed in, um, or after sound check, uh, you know, after you've adjusted the gain and the EQ for, for the service and you're just in kind of mix mode, uh, you really shouldn't have to move off of this too much. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is a matrix um, that we're using for the, uh, the stream to get to the live, and I'll, I'll walk through that a little bit later on, on how we're doing that, but, yep, yeah, yeah, so we are using a matrix that's a little bit different than we taught in the video courses, um, but uh, yeah, we'll get into that in a little bit. But I just wanted to, to show the exact workflow of, um, of how this board is working so that when you see me mixing, you, you understand what's happening with the 
entire mix. So, um, Chipper, do you mind going back to the uh, pro presenter? We can walk through a little bit more. Um, So in, in any mix, uh, there are certain ingredients, and we've talked through this a little bit, but uh, it's getting quality source tone. So uh, there's a lot of different examples of this, but say you're, you're miking a drum kit, you want to make sure that the drums, the microphones are placed properly, um, even that the drums are tuned properly. It's going to make a world of difference um, just capturing the proper signal. Uh, and then we have our gain structure, and I'll actually play a little bit of, of this multi-track and show you exactly what you're shooting for. So if I just go ahead and solo um, a vocal here, we'll see it come in. Uh, you might, I don't know where the fader's at on the, the main mix chipper, but I'm going to have to uh, play this at full volume so that we hit the compressors the right way. Um, so let me get to our vocal. So even before I pull the vocal up, before we listen to it, uh, what we want to do is look at it um, and see the actual input metering. And every board is going to have, not every board, a lot of boards are going to have different numbers on the side as far as what they consider unity or clipping or zero. Um, but a good general rule is just to be hitting the yellow so or orange on this board. If I were to make it clip, let me just see where I'm at. If I were to make it clip, you'd see it hitting the red um, at the top. Not, yeah, necessarily on this one, but um, you want to be going for just as it's hitting the yellow. So good thing to remember is green is go, yellow is slow down, and I guess clipping is, is go backwards, <laughs> not necessarily stop. Um, but that's what you want to do with your, your gain. And if I were to have too low of gain structure. If I was coming way down here um, with, our, with our input, it's not going to hit the compressor properly. Um, so here it's not even hitting the compressor because the gain is too low. So that's what I mean when I say that the gain affects everything down the line with your channel signal flow. So let's get this back up to where it's supposed to be. And then you can see it's hitting the, the compressor properly and we're getting about you know, almost 6 dB of, of gain reduction on our compressor. Um, if I had all these settings right, and then I, I started doing a sound check and I didn't get proper gain structure, it wouldn't matter the rest of the processing, processing that I did because it, um, the signal wouldn't be going into those processing uh, units properly. So. That is gain structure. Sorry, Chipper, I'm having you go back and forth a lot. Uh, but we're going to talk about the actual processing next. Uh, so we talked about what EQ, compression, and um, effects are. But just for an example, uh, we can listen to this vocal, and I can turn off the processing, and then we'll talk about uh, exactly what's happening with it. So we've got our, our raw signal here. And it's, it's captured pretty well. But um, you know it still has some work to do. So we've already got our gain structure. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is our low cut. Um, oh, okay, perfect. You can go back to the board there. So even there, you can see that cutting out a lot of that low end cleans up the signal a lot. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you, on every channel, you should have a low cut. Uh, it's just how far up it goes um, as far as depending on the instrument itself and how much low end is a part of the instrument. But um, every channel should have a low cut, uh, and you can hear it makes a pretty big difference. Uh, get back to over here. So our next uh, section we're going to look at is our compressor. And on, on a vocal, I'm not really as concerned about the gate, but that's going to make a bigger difference on the drums. So uh, we'll go through a drum channel, channel as well so you can hear that. Um, but with our compressor on this one, I've got a um, fairly fast attack, hold and release time. And uh, you can really experiment with those just to, to hear um, what you like the best. And I won't tell you that you can just like buy a template or like copy some settings and then it's going to work for you. Uh, I really think that everyone should just like learn how to use their ears. There are some starting points that you can, that you can use, but um, 
I don't like to get into the numbers too much because uh, some people get stuck in that, like, oh, well, this person said I should have my attack set at this number, um, so we won't do too much of that. But uh, we can give a listen to our compressor here. So you can hear that uh, it's kind of leveling out the, uh, the dynamic range of the instrument. And just for a, a technical example uh, or definition of a compressor, every time uh, it reaches um, past this threshold, so every time it tries to go above the threshold, um, whatever your ratio is, it's going to be compressed uh, that many times. So a 3 to 1 ratio, um, the signal is uh, being compressed 3 to 1. Um, so uh, you can see we get past that point, and we're shooting for you know about six dB of com uh, compression. So it's being brought down six dB um, at its loudest points. So after that, we've got our equalizer, um, and just for an example of, of this vocal, what I'm doing is cutting out some of the low end um, uh, with a low shelf. So a low shelf is uh, everything below a certain frequency is being brought down. Um, the low cut takes everything out. Um, it you know, takes it down to you know, infinity or you know, zero signal to pass through. A low shelf just lowers um, everything below a certain frequency by a specific amount. Um, and then we're using a couple different uh, parameters um, in the, the mid-range to, to get rid of some like nasally sounds, which is, is usually prominent in in most vocals. And then um, our high, we're boosting a little bit. So I can show you. I can give you an example of... Uh, so not really pleasant. Let me pull that out. And um, you can't really do this in a live scenario where you've got the whole band there, but um, uh, just in more of a training kind of scenario. Uh, a method I like to use is uh, sometimes called seek and destroy or search and destroy. Uh, so we'll just play this, and I'll boost the, um, the EQ in a specific range here, and then you can sweep back and forth the frequency. And then when you find something you don't like, you can pull it out. And uh, even doing that in practice, you can kind of learn different instruments of, uh, okay, like this kind of vocal or this kind of instrument is generally going to have something uh, that's not desirable in this range. Um, so like I just know in a lot of male vocals, uh, about 1 to 2K, you're going to get that kind of nasally hee kind of sound that um, you might need to pull out. So clearly here it, it proved true, but I can show you the, the actual search and destroy method. So even this one we could pull out. So like I said, um, you can't do that in a live scenario because you can't you know, solo the vocal and then boost it and then have potential for feedback through the speakers. Um, but in, in a scenario where you're doing a virtual sound check, uh, that's a really good method to use. Um, so we've covered our low cut, our compression, and our EQ, and that's going to be on, on every single channel. Um, in this first method, method that we're talking about with a live stream mix, um, it's going to be based on the soundboard and then sending that to a uh, matrix feed and then going to your live stream. Uh, in the next session, we'll talk about sending audio um, to a, a DAW. So uh, session two, you'll see you know, all this processing happening on the DAW. Session one, we're just focused on using your soundboard. So, so I'm going to get back to our slides here. Um, so we've got our quality source tone, our gain structure, our processing, and then our actual mixing. Um, when you're using this method of mixing through a soundboard, going to a matrix to your live stream, um, all the processing that's happening on the board is going to affect what's going to the live stream. So you really have to 
kind of mix the two together. Make sure that you're getting a good sound in your room as well as your live stream. Um, and one thing that's going to make a big difference in that is making sure that your room is tuned properly and that it's got good acoustics because um, if you have speakers that aren't properly tuned, uh, you're going to do some crazy things with your EQ on the channel level. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll get into that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because it was on the slide. Um, yeah, well, I'll do a little bit of a demo of a, of a full mix a little bit later on. I just wanted to, to get through our, our channel through um, mix part. Um, yeah, no problem. Yeah, so uh, when you're doing your mix on your soundboard and it's going to your live stream um, and your room isn't properly tuned, you're just going to do some really crazy things with your EQ on the, the channel level to make it sound right in the house. So you should be able to just play a track from Spotify through your house um, and it sound good. And if it doesn't, um, you can either hire an integrator and have them come in and, and tune your room properly, which is, is my number one recommendation. Um, but if you're feeling adventurous and uh, you want to, you can um, tune the room yourself and you just have to make sure you have a good set of ears and probably um, a second opinion there. Um, and, and I talked through that in the, the mixing for worship course. Um, but we, we do a pretty good example of what we did in this room with making sure that our, our front speakers um, were tuned properly and then our rear speakers were tuned properly and that there's the right amount of delay between them. Um, so there's a lot of science that goes into it. Um, so if you're, if you're strapped for time or you're uh, nervous about ruining your, your sound system, um, I'd just say hire an integrator and they do a great job of, uh, of making sure your room is tuned properly. All that to say, um, you need to have the room tuned when you're, when you're doing this because uh, everything that you do on a channel level, like we just talked about, is going to affect your live stream mix. Um, and then uh, mastering is not something that you always necessarily think about with a live mix. Um, but there are certain things that you should be doing on your, your broadcast mix that um, I'll show you the exact uh, processing we're doing on this uh, in a little while. Um, but when you're, you're going to a format where, where people are listening on different places, uh, like you know, their laptop or a phone or a TV, um, you really need to have a lower dynamic range than you would in a front of house live mix. Uh, and you also generally need to have a little bit more high frequency content. Um, so there's, there's different things that you need to do when people are listening on different devices, um, as opposed to in the room, you have control of exactly how the sound system is tuned, what it sounds like. Uh, everyone's listening in the same space. So uh, it's, it's not something you think about as much in a live scenario, um, but that's something that we'll, we'll cover um, and that's why it's one of the ingredients of our broadcast mix. And then something that you also have to consider is routing uh, and doing the audio sync. So making sure that your, uh, your final mix is going to however you're streaming, whether it be you know, ProPresenter or Resi or a streaming box of some kind, uh, you need to get your, your stereo live stream mix to that and it needs to be synced with the video. Um, so there, there's a couple different methods, and uh, it's very distracting when it's not synced. So um, one thing that you can do, uh, I'm, I'll just even show you now, um, if you want to see the full like routing method and seeing it be synced with video, um, you can go into our studio tomorrow, and we'll, we'll put this soundboard in there um, so you can see it in action. Uh, but just quickly, uh, here's our live stream output mix, um, and then... We have a, uh, in our routing here, in our outputs, uh, we have a delay button. So outputs one and two, they're our live stream. Um, you can apply delay on the soundboard, uh, or you can apply delay within um, ProPresenter if you're using that for streaming. Um, but you need to make sure that your audio is delayed so that it's synced up with video. Cool. Um, and then the next thing I want to talk about is the two methods. Like I said, today we're going to talk about mixing with a digital console. So we'll, we'll walk through um, a live stream mix of just using um, 
this for our a live stream mix, and then we're going to talk about mixing in a box in the next session. So I'll pull up Ableton, and you'll be able to see the screen um, and how we're doing the processing um, to do our mix there. Um, and just a couple of, of tips uh, in general for your broadcast mix. Um, one is to use congregation mics. So we have a couple. You probably can't see them that well. They're in the dark. But up here, we have a couple of shotgun mics that, that capture the sound of the congregation singing. And it's really nice to mix that into your broadcast mix because uh, it helps people feel more at home. Um, if you were in here in the room, you would be hearing others sing around you, um, experiencing that singing psalms and spiritual songs to one another uh, that we read about in the Bible. And then um, the other is room mics. If, if you've been in a room before, you know that you hear reflections off the walls and you hear the sound of the sound system and, and also a little bit of people singing around you. Um, it's nice to add those into the broadcast mix to feel the, have the online congregation feel like they're there in the room um, a little bit more. And those would be located at the front of house booth pointing towards the, um, the stage. So there are some different things you have to get into as far as um, having those properly delayed so that you don't hear um, your, your actual live stream mix and then those microphones later. Um, but that's something that you can dive into. Don't necessarily have time for it today. Um, and then vocal tuning really helps a broadcast mix. Here in, in this kind of environment, uh, there's a, you know, a lot of reverb um, being applied through the board. There's a lot of reverb and, and reflections happening in the room. Um, it's a lot more forgiving in a room. Um, when you're listening to a broadcast mix, you really hear um, pitch issues with, with vocalists. So uh, vocal tuning is really nice to add. If you have a soundboard that has that capability, um, you can do that with the method we're talking about in the first session. Um, if you don't, uh, you, and you're mixing in a box, it's, it's really easy to add a vocal tuning plug-in. Um, we're not trying to be American Idol or anything, but just tightening it up a little bit uh, makes a big difference. So uh, the process of doing this, gain staging processing, we talked about that. Um, we're going to create a live stream bus matrix, sorry, live stream mix matrix. Um, like Jake said, we just changed this method a little bit yesterday. So um, if you want to throw the board back up, I can give a, another walkthrough of that quick. Um, we've got all of our channels, and a, those are going into buses. And then um, each of these buses are being routed to a matrix. So if I go to our matrices here, um, and let me just explain quick, a, a matrix is a group of buses that can be sent to an output. So um, if we had, if this were the soundboard controlling the room, it would also have uh, matrices for our front speakers as well as the, the fill speakers and the subs so that our, our main mix would be going to those three different locations. So you can kind of think of it as a, a grouping of um, the buses or outputs or mixes that go to a physical output. So this matrix is our live stream. And when I, when I select it um, and put sends on fader, we can see our bus master has each of the, um, our, our matrix, sorry, our matrix one and two for our live stream has the drum parallel compression group, the instrument group, the vocals, and the drums, as well as uh, a grouping of delay, reverb, um, well, just delay and reverb for this, for this mix um, going into it. So not only are you getting the same bus compression that you are for your front of house mix, it's going to your live stream. And I just had to route uh, our effects to another set of faders so that we can have reverb and delay in our live stream. Um, I'll go through that later. I'll show you what it's like if you, if you don't have reverb and delay, but it's, it's, not, as, it's not as nice. You definitely have to add that to your mix. So um, after we do that, um, we want to select our matrix and have it be stereo. Um, you always want to have a, a stereo mix for your broadcast mix so you can do some panning and have effects uh, spread out a little bit. Um, oh, I think I went too far back. Oh, okay, I guess not. 
Um, so we're, we're selecting our matrix. We made it stereo um, on this board specifically. Um, if you choose matrix one or three or five, an odd number, you hit this link button, and it pulls in the next fader next to it. Um, so we've linked our channels. I've named it. It's good to name your channels. Just get into the practice of that. Um, and we have all of our buses post fader and post pan. So that means if you make a pan or a fader move on your main mix, it's going to be reflected in your live stream mix. Um, one thing I didn't say at the top of this is that this method allows for a more hands-free experience. Like you don't have to have someone uh, specifically wearing headphones the entire service actively mixing because whatever uh, you do on your front of house mix is going to be reflected in your live stream mix. Um, and the reason that we want those post fader and post pan is so that as you're mixing, you have someone, uh, you know, vocal one is leading, and then song two, uh, vocal two is leading. When you make those changes in the house, it'll be in the live stream mix as well. Sorry, that was a really quick thing. Um, so then after our, our post fader, post pan mix, we're going to do our mastering. Um, so, so just real quick to show you on this board specifically, I'm giving you lots of work, Chipper. Um, we have our, well, I guess that's more on this screen. Um, we're using these different buses, and you want to make sure that they are uh, post pan. Um, so you want to hit this follow left right button so that your pans follow the left right buses. And then um, you want to make sure that it is uh, post fader as well. So you can see here, these ones are post fader. These ones are post EQ. Um, so we want to make sure that these are post fader. So um, that's how you adjust that on, on this board. Make sure my other one is post fader. Good deal. So. Um, that's how you do that. And then uh, with our mastering, um, let me see where I'm at with, with slides and time. Yeah, so I think at this point we can just um, go through the actual mix of what I have going on. And obviously uh, this is a, you know, a front of house mix console thing. So what we're listening to is the actual live stream mix. Um, but everything that I'm doing would also affect the main mix. So let's see. I got till 10.45 with this one? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so um, real quick, I'll just build our, our mix here so you can hear how I'm doing that. And then um, I can show you a little bit of processing on specific channels. Um, actually, let's start, with, uh, let's start with the drum because I think um, out of anything, this has been the most processed, uh, specifically with, with transient instruments like the, the actual kick, snare, toms. Um, having gates enabled and set properly just make a huge difference. So uh, we can listen to our, our uh, kick soloed here. So on here, um, here's our unprocessed channel. So there's a lot of bleed going on there. Um, what we want to do is, is use our gate to, uh, to fix that. So when you use the gate, all you get is the kick. Um, so how I de determined how to set this was I used the threshold, and I just play the instrument, and um, the snare hits and the tom hits, those are going to be quieter because the, the microphone is focused on the kick drum, but it's, it's capturing the sound from the other instruments. Uh, so I just set my threshold so only the kick drum comes through. So if you can see the little dot um, moving back and forth, uh, only when it goes above that, that diagonal line is when it's allowed to come through. So that's how we have our gate set. Um, this, this, this mix specifically has two microphones for the kick. So uh, the kick in, we're only focusing on the snap or the attack. So I've put a low cut on there. Then we have an EQ, which is also doing um, some processing, pulling out some mid-range frequencies and boosting the snap. 
So that's, that probably doesn't sound that great on its own, but when we open up the kick out, um, it adds a low end to it. Um, and if we were to only listen to the kick out, you're just hearing that, that low end. So um, that's probably not the method that most of you are using. I'm, I'm assuming most of you probably just have one, one kick mic. But uh, I am interested. Is anyone here using a kick in and a kick out on their, on their drums? All right. So <laughs> this method doesn't apply to a ton of you. But you do want to capture the low end of the kick as well as the high end of the kick um, and marry those two. And that's, that's what using a kick in and a kick out does there. Um, so we can just listen to the rest of our, our full mix here. And then... Um, I'll just show you a little bit of how we're pulling in our a bus. Yeah, yeah. So a really common one is a a, a Sure a Beta ninety one, I think it's called, and it's just like a a flat piezo kind of mic that you you like literally just like set in the kick mic. Um, so your kick mic should have a hole in it, and then you just set your kick uh, your microphone in it, and then you have a second one that's like further out, so it's capturing more of the boom, um, the resonant head on the front of the drum. So that's, um, I mean, it's a fairly popular method. I've mixed a lot of shows with, with two microphones, but um, I think that with a singular Sure Beta 52 or a Audix D6 microphone placed properly, you can get um, the best of both worlds. So, um, yeah, and, and I want to make sure that you guys see exactly what's happening with, with the full mix of, of using the buses and the bus compression going into our live stream and then hear the differences of, uh, of the, the mastering kind of thing that we're doing on the live stream. So um, I'll just do more of a, a quick mix and, and A-B some of those things so you can hear what they're doing. So try to pull all this out. So I'll start from uh, scratch here. Um, we've got all of our channels going into these these buses. So I'll start with the kick out, pull in. Of course, we get to a break right there. And uh, with snare bottom, I like to add. Like, if I kept it at the same level, you'd hear a lot of uh, too much of that bottom snare. So I usually have that a little bit lower. Um, so we've got our parallel compression. Um, you can hopefully hear, like, there's a lot of compression happening. Um, so if we just use our dry, our dry mix, it's a little more dynamic, um, then we can pull in the compressed sound. Um, just helps pull out the transients, more attack. So obviously that's really quick mix, but we have all of our instruments coming into these buses. And um, like I said, we're listening to the uh, matrix mix. So if I were to play this again um, and adjust the individual instruments, you heard that those were being adjusted. Um, but the, the trick with having a live stream matrix mix in this method is um, kind of using it to uh, adjust what's happening for the live stream uh, versus the the room. So in here, um, if we had a live band playing with a real acoustic drum kit, you would want more, you'd probably pull the volume of the drums down in the house, um, but you can compensate uh, on your live stream mix by just pushing it up louder for your live stream mix. So um, 
If you're doing this method, you want to have some headphones and solo the live stream mix so that you can hear what's going to that and be able to uh, make a couple of, of tweaks like that. Um, same thing for uh, teaching. If we had uh, teaching microphones in this, matri or in this uh, multi track here, you have another bus for live uh, for the teaching, and you could you know, push that up a little bit louder um, so that the the teaching is louder for the stream than it would be in the room. Um, but we've got our, our live stream mix coming to this matrix. And then uh, what I've done here is I've added a little bit of bus compression. So bus compression is uh, putting compression on a group of channels like our uh, drums or our vocals. Um, so additionally on on all of these buses, you'll see that there is some bus compression happening. But then on our our final output, our main stream matrix mix, we have some compression happening here as well. Um, and it's pretty light. It's a two to one ratio, um, not a lot of gain reduction. So it, it's really just kind of helping glue it together and, and keeping any um, big dynamics from, from popping out. So we can hear that. So um, especially in a, a live sound system, it's, it's pretty subtle. Uh, if you were to throw some in-ears on, you'd probably hear the difference a little bit more. Um, but the other thing that we have on our live stream output mix is this stereo enhancer. And this is um, uh, kind of enhancing the, the harmonic content of the mix. Um, in a simpler term, it's, it's another EQ. Um, it works scientifically a little bit differently. but um, I can go to here, I can enable it and disable it. Uh, so on this board specifically, what you do is have this as one of your effects, your effects racks, and then you would route um, the input of your live stream to it. So here you can see we have our uh, effects rack number six, and I just scrolled through until I got to matrix two, which is where we're pulling our live stream mix from. And then I have it enabled. So I have it inserted um, there. So I can turn this off, and you can hear what it sounds like. Uh, and clearly, there is um, some, some output differentiation there. It's, it's, it's boosting um, the output. So I can even turn this down so you get a, a, a better example, and you're not just thinking it sounds better because it's louder. So um, the low end was boosted a little bit. The high frequencies uh, were, were cleared, uh, were a little bit higher, so you know, some more of that high frequency content. And then the mid range was dialed in a little bit as well. Um, so you can see, uh, well, it's more because our high and low frequencies are being boosted. Um, in effect, it's kind of like turning down the mid-range. Um, so that is our, our full mix. We've got all of our channels going into buses. All of our buses on this side are being sent to our matrix, and then our matrix is being routed to our live stream. And uh, like I said, you can, we'll pull this board over to the studio tomorrow, and you can see the exact routing of it. Um, but uh, essentially, whatever whatever you're going into, uh, you want to make sure that your live stream is routed to the inputs of your, your ATEM, switcher, uh, pro presenter, uh, what have you. Um, yeah, so that covers our, our full mix. And um, we can do a couple of, of quick questions. Um, and then if we don't get to all of them, you can save them for this afternoon. But uh, our next session is going to be about mixing in a DAW. And just to show you the difference a little bit, um, I pulled in an example of it. So here, here again is our doing a live stream on a digital console.
And again, I, I just realized I didn't show you the, uh, the effects. Um, so when you have a, a live stream bus mix that doesn't have any reverb, you'll get to hear that sounds like. Yeah. Um, so it's really important to have that, that reverb and delay also routed to your live stream mix. Um, but that's what, that's what I think that is a pretty good sound. Like I've, I've worked on this mix for a little while. I'm not sure I can get um, a whole lot out of uh, doing any more processing. Uh, but I do have a clip of what you can achieve when you use um, a DAW like Ableton Live. I'm just going to turn our mastering off of there and then open this up. So you can see some of what I'm doing. So what I'm doing here is we have our, our auxes coming in um, to one and two, and I'm just pulling this into a bus mix so that we have it, uh, so I can send it to our, our matrix here. So we've got our matrix, and we're going to pull in bus 11 and 12, and this will just be our aux one and two. Uh, so that's just an example of, of what you can achieve when you're able to do um, drum replacement, vocal tuning, um, using Waves plugins, things like that. Um, so just because it, it took me a long time to, to get that up, I'll go back to our other mix so you can hear what that sounds like. Do a little bit more AB there. So again, here's um, the best mix that I could come up with on an X32. So if you were to ask me uh, what method should I go with, I mean, I would say try and get a DAW mix going. But uh, if you don't have the volunteer base for that um, or you don't have the equipment for it yet uh, and you want to get a live stream mix going, I think using a digital console is a great way to, to get started with it. And it doesn't require uh, as much attention during the service to be actively mixing all those inputs. But um, I think that this is a, a really good way to go using the DAW mix. And then that's what we'll talk about in the next session. So um, we can take a couple questions now, uh, if anyone has any specifically about the, um, the board mix and how that works. Yeah. Um, no, so uh, the way that you would route this is um, all of our, our buses here. Uh, so the, the drum, the instrument, the vocals, uh, these are groups. And then um, you can see there's this button here. Yeah, it's still up there. Uh, stereo bus. So that's going to your main left, right. So um, if we had these plugged into a set of the house speakers, you'd hear the main mix um, in the room, and then um, your stream mix would be routed to, you know, whatever live streaming device you're using. Um, so all these buses uh, that we heard as we were mixing um, would also go to the mains. Right, yeah, there's no, there's no matrix for your house mix, there's only the matrix for the live stream. Okay, so for the matrix for the live stream, you said that if you soloed that matrix, then you could go in and make kind of micro adjustments to what your stream is hearing, and it will not affect the in-house sound. Right, so um, you could... Zane to the rescue. This is Zane. Uh, he was unavailable earlier, but... Yeah, so um, we're saying the, the, these buses here, um, 
Everything that you, you mix as far as channels go into these buses. And then um, when you go into your, your matrix here for your live stream, you can select that and hit uh, sends on fader. And then on this side of the board, when you go to your buses, you can change how much is going to this live stream. So you're not, you're not doing it on a channel level. You're not saying, I want my, my live stream to hear more of this vocal or that vocal. Um, you're doing that with your live mix, and then everything you do with your live mix goes into these buses. And then you can change how much of the buses are being sent to the matrix. So, um, yeah, with your live stream here, sends on fader to buses. Like in here, if you were doing a live mix with live drums, you'd probably turn the drums down for your live stream, or turn the drum, sorry, turn the drums up for your live stream. Um, but in your house, you might have them lower just because drums are making sound on stage. Does that make sense? Yeah, the, so um, this method, there's a lot of where it goes from point A to point B. You know, there's a lot happening in between there. Um, so, and I know that this is a lot to, to take in in a, a live environment, you know, with, with the, uh, the, the lessons that we make online. You can pause it and go back and watch it 10 times. And, and even I do that if, um, if I'm about to help someone with something and it's like, let me get a refresher on that. So I know that you can't uh, do that in this live environment, but um, if you have questions, um, you know, we can always like draw a different diagram or write something down. And um, if you're watching, if you're a part of the uh, worship ministry school, you can watch these lessons and, um, you know, pause and try it and go back, so. Yeah. Um, Zane, do you want to grab the, the microphone? Or do you have another one? Yeah, Perfect. Um, so I was wondering what limitations with that setup for the live stream, what limitations are there with like, you wouldn't necessarily be able to change EQ on a specific channel only for the live stream, correct? It would have to be at the bus level? Right. And yeah, so the... The example I played at the end of the Ableton mix, I was able to do separate EQ, separate compression, um, separate delay and reverb. Um, but with this method, you're, you're using the EQs and compressions um, from your live mix. And so that's why at the beginning I said you need to have your room tuned properly um, so that you know d whatever system you're listening on, it sounds good. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying with a properly tuned room, it should sound good over the live stream without having to custom edit yeah. channels specifically for that. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like you can get a pretty good mix. Um, you know, I'm on this side of the speakers, but I feel like the, the Ableton mix is, you know, a little bit more dialed in. Um, but I think that, that this method, if you do it well, is totally listenable, you know? Okay, yeah, yeah that makes sense, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Quick questions. So uh, for the vocal tuning, uh, I'm assuming that's like auto-tune? Like yeah, yeah, minor. you kind of, uh, and I'll, I will get more into that in the, the next session so you okay. can see like exactly what's happening. This soundboard doesn't have uh, vocal tuning natively on it. Um, so that, that just wouldn't be part of your, your digital board mix. I got you. Because I was curious, how do you like set it up? Like uh, if you have a channel for tuning for each person, is yes. there a way to change it if like a key switches for a different song like efficiently? Um, uh, it depends on, if you're using Antares and a certain DAW, uh, it can work. Um, we're using Waves Tune Live. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you'll see what I, exactly I do in the, the next session. Okay. So yeah, and I think um, if you have any other questions, you can just write them down um, and then we'll, we'll cover those in the, the Q&A in the panel later. But uh, do you want to, Give everybody a break. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Let's uh, give him a hand. And...